So here was our warm up problem. I gave us a differential equation and asked that we verify that this is a solution to this differential equation. So I'm not asking us to solve this, although we could because this happens to be separable. Instead, we're going to verify that this works with this equation, meaning we're going to check the left hand side and the right hand side and show that they work out to be the same thing. On the left hand side, I know that I'm going to take x and multiply that by the derivative dy dx. Hmm. This, unfortunately, is not written in a way that says y equals. So, fun, I know I made it extra fun, we are going to take the derivative of this thing implicitly. Good times. So if I take the derivative of natural log of x, I would get 1 over x. And when I take the derivative of 1 over y, I'm going to get one, negative 1 over y squared times dy dx. And when I take the derivative on the right hand side, the derivative of c is 0 because c is some sort of constant. Well, where do we go from there? We are trying to somehow turn this into that. So one option is that we rearrange this to solve for dy dx. And that's probably my thought of how we would go about this. So the first thing I'm going to do is to subtract 1 over x from both sides. So I'll have negative 1 over y squared dy dx is equal to negative 1 over x. Now, because I've got that negative on both sides, I could quickly multiply both sides by negative 1 and get rid of those minus signs. And to get the dy dx by itself, I would end up multiplying both sides by y squared times y squared. So now I'm at dy dx is equal to y squared over x, if I wanted to squish that into one thing. So now back to our differential equation, I'm going to scoot it over a little bit for us x dy dx is equal to y squared. And this is the thing we're trying to verify. So I always like to remind myself, I'm going to give myself a question mark here, just to remember, this is the thing we're trying to show is true. Well, now I've got my expression for dy dx. So I'd have x and then plug in y squared over x. And we want to know, is that the same as y squared? And guess what? It is. My x's will cancel out. y squared is, in fact, equal to y squared. We are good to go. This is a solution to this differential equation. First of all, if I'm going to solve this, it is good to just do a quick check of what kind of differential equation it is. Again, it's a differential equation because I have a derivative and an equal sign. Y is the variable on top of my derivative piece, and Y is the only variable that appears over here, which does make this autonomous. Every autonomous differential equation is separable. They're not always easy to integrate, but they are always separable. Let's go ahead and separate this one. We should be able to separate and integrate. So it is a separable differential equation. To go about separating, I'm starting the way I always do, I'm going to multiply both sides by dt. My dt's are now gone, and then I look over here and I say, oh wait, I'm expecting to have t's, and instead I've got y's. So I'll need to move the y's to the left-hand side of this. Now that's kind of messy and hard to see what we're doing next, so I'm going to clean it up. And on the left-hand side, rewrite that to look like 1 divided by 4 minus 3y dy is equal to, and over here, it's an invisible 1, but I like to actually write it. We've got a 1 dt. Now I'm ready to integrate both sides. On the left-hand side, after you've done a ton of problems that look like this, or if you added this to your 
um, page of notes for the first short test. Anytime we have something, and I'm thinking like back to 4.6 stuff. Anytime I have something that looks like one divided by essentially the equation of a line, which I could write as a plus bx or something, dx, anytime this is the case, I know that my solution should look like natural log of a plus bx all divided by b and then we'll stick our happy plus a constant out here. If this doesn't feel comfortable for you, that's okay. This should always be a u substitution. So we can get through it with a u sub. I'm gonna give myself a little bit more space and I'm gonna move that one dt over just so that I have a little bit of room to write in my u sub here. When I look at this, I know that I can take that entire denominator and call that u. Well, that's going to make du negative 3 dy. I don't have that negative 3. I secretly have a 1 dy. So I will go ahead and divide by negative 3. So I'm going to divide by negative 3 and divide by negative 3. So I am looking at negative one third du is equal to dy. Rewriting this in terms of our u's, we get negative one third times the integral of one over u du, or negative one third, actually, let me put it in black now because we're, I'm going to do two steps at once. That's going to turn into a natural log of u. And then I know I'm going to have to plug back in what the u equals. So I'm doing two steps at once here, and I'm going to end up with negative one third natural log absolute value for minus three y. And we can go ahead and integrate the right hand side at this point and get a t plus a constant. I'm going to pause for a second because there's a there was a question in the chat about how do I know that it's separable. Every pure time differential is separable. Every autonomous differential equation is also separable. So we'll start there. My other statement about how do I know it's separable is we try, and if it works, it was separable. If I can get all of one variable on one side and all of the other variable on the other side, then I know it was separable. The book gives us a statement about everything that's separable. We should be able to write in the form if I had, and I'm choosing letters here, but if I had dy dx, in order to be separable, there should be a way to write it as some function of only y times some function of only x. And the multiplication here is critical. If I can somehow factor it, so I've got only a function of y times only a function of x, then I know that it's separable. I hope that helped a little bit. Um, I'm still confused. So, but you only have one variable y on the other side. So how do you know it's a separable equation? So that gets back to everything that's autonomous is automatically separable. And everything that is pure time is also automatically separable. And the way to think about that here is either of these functions could be a constant. So if this looks like dy dx is equal to a number times a function of x, well, that number is essentially our stand-in for the function of y. A number is still a function. So it still meets these criteria. Or if this looked like dy dx is equal to a function of y times a number, that also meets our criteria because a number is a function of x. But like you only have one, like, so, so just by looking at this, how do you know it's separable? I still don't understand. Um, so I think the perhaps the more important starting point 
is that if I started with, if I go back to the beginning when it said dy dt is equal to four minus three y, the more important thing is that you can recognize that this is autonomous. And if we can recognize that it's autonomous, then it is separable. You're guaranteed that it's separable. And could you remind me what autonomous means one more time? Yeah, so autonomous means that whatever the variable is in the numerator, that's the only letter we see over here. Okay, thank you. And anytime that it's autonomous, if it helps you, just go ahead and put the entire thing in parentheses and write times one, because secretly that's your function of t. And that's how I write it when I go to take the integral. Now for a pure time differential, it doesn't actually have to be the letter t, but if this said dy dx equals um, five plus two x, this we would call a pure time differential because the variable in the denominator is the only letter that we see over here. And again, we can do the same kind of thing that I just did with that times one and give ourselves an invisible times one to see that we, we still do really have two functions. So it doesn't it's, matter if it's on the numerator or denominator as long as it's the only variable on the right-hand side? It will always be separable, correct. Okay. And okay. when you have a mix of X's and Y's, then there has to be a way for us to write it in this form in order for it to be separable. Can you do an example of all X's and of both X's and Y's on the same side? Yeah, we'll do, we'll do that next, sure. So I do wanna make sure that we actually get back around and finish this problem off. Um, so there's a question in the chat about, um, whether the t plus c side needs to be negative. Um, it, we can either leave the negative one third over there or we can make it negative on this side. It's really up to you. We just need a negative somewhere. Okay. I'm going to keep going on this problem and then we're going to get back to the vocabulary question because there is a long stream of questions related to our vocabulary for differential equations. So we'll go there in just a second. For the time being, I need the space. So I'm going to erase all of these things. And we have a choice to make right now. We can either solve for this constant right now or we can rearrange it. I want to go ahead and rearrange it for y in just a second. Um, oh, and there's a question in the chat about homework problems. This is my homework problem one in my web work. So I know everyone has slightly different numbers, but this is my problem one. Okay, so let's keep going. Solving for y is about to be some messy algebra. And I'm going to do it, and we've been talking about this for a couple days, but I'm going to keep dragging this constant around, and I'm going to do the mathematician thing, which means anytime this constant is multiplied by a number, added to a number, e to the constant, I'm going to make it a new constant. I really want a bigger board. It's okay. We got this. So I'm going to just recopy this entire thing up here, but I'm going to multiply both sides of the equation by negative three. So I'm going to multiply that side by negative three and this side by negative three. So that I'm left with natural log absolute value four minus three y is equal to negative three t minus three times that constant c. And I said I was going to do the mathematician thing, which means I would take that negative 3c and call it a new letter. But I'll hold off and I'll call it a new letter sort of at the end. I'll keep dragging it around with me for a minute. When I have nat 
natural log of the absolute value of something, technically on my next step, I should get the plus or minus version of that something. But we're going to hold off on that with a mathematician -y trick. So I'm going to rewrite this to say 4 minus 3y. Um, and maybe I'll even keep, I'll keep the absolute value on there for just a second. So I'll have the absolute value of 4 minus 3y is equal to e to the negative 3t minus 3c. Now, I'm going to rewrite the right-hand side using exponent rules. So I've got 4 minus 3y in absolute value still is equal to e to the negative 3t times e to the negative 3c. And this is where I'm going to pull a mathematician trick on us. And I'm going to say whatever that constant c is, e raised to the negative 3 times that constant is some new constant. I'm going to call it A. On my next line, because A can take on either a positive or negative value, because it can be either positive or negative, I don't need the absolute value signs on this anymore. I can write it as 4 minus 3y is equal to A e to the negative 3t. More algebra coming. Now I need to get the y by itself. Why? Because WebWork asked me to type in my answer as y equals. So I got to get it to that form. I'm going to do two algebra steps at once. I'm going to add 3y to both sides. And I'm going to subtract this whole thing from both sides. And I'll be left with 4 minus a e to the negative 3t is equal to 3y. Almost to our last step here, but I'm going to divide both sides by 3. I get 4 thirds minus a over 3 e to the negative 3t is equal to y. And my last step is going to be to do the mathematician thing again and take that a over 3 and call it some new constant. You do not have to do that step. Professor Chudery ha has been doing these steps of combining the constant in class. But he's also been careful to say that you don't have to. It's really a personal choice for you whether you want to or not. I'm going to go ahead and erase our integration part so that we can deal with that initial condition. So I am now to y equals 4 thirds plus b e to the negative 3t. And there's a question in the chat about web work. Web work isn't going to care whether you deal with the constant or not, because the problems where that's going to show up in web work, we have an initial condition. So we're not going to end up typing in a b we have to actually solve for b given our initial condition problem. So here, this is telling me that when t equals 2, y equals 3. And we're going to plug that in here to solve for that constant b. That 3 is equal to 4 thirds plus b e to the negative, and when I plug in 2 for t, that'll become e to the negative 6. This is messy, and this is gross. So my recommendation, um, my recommendation is to just leave it messy and gross and kind of type that into web work. Um, someone asked, could we have left this as a negative a over 3? Absolutely, you could leave it as a negative a over 3. It's a choose your own adventure through the algebra. I'm going to go through and finish this off, but I've got 3 minus 4 thirds. You can either mess with the fractions or not. 
If you don't feel like it, I can leave that as three minus four thirds is equal to b e to the negative six, which would make b three minus four thirds divided by e to the negative six. So as a web work problem, I would then be taking this entire thing, plugging it in here, and typing in that entire equation. When I look at this, I know it's a differential equation because I have a derivative and an equal sign. The only variable on the right-hand side is y, and y is in the numerator, so this is autonomous. Now, when we've been looking at autonomous differential equations, we've actually had two ways of dealing with these. And I'm going to erase that word solve for a second. Um, we've had two ways of dealing with autonomous differential equations. One is to actually solve them because they are separable. And the other is to sketch phase plots. And when we sketch those phase plots, we're looking for equilibria and their stability. So those are the things that we've been doing with autonomous differential equations. If the equation looked almost the same here, but it actually said dy dx, is equal to x squared plus one. Because the only thing we're dealing with over here is x's, and x is in the denominator, this would be referred to as a pure time differential. And in terms of the pure time differentials, really what we've been doing with those is solving them. That's it. Really, that's what we've been doing with them, is solving them. Now, so far, in terms of things that we've been looking at, I might also have something like dy dx equals, um, let me make this y times, let me make it look slightly messier. Let me make it y minus x squared y. Well, if I look at this, I have both x's and y's on the right-hand side. So I already know it's not pure time and it's not autonomous. What I want to do is, so this technically we could list as being non-autonomous. Now, I will also say that the vocabulary in, laying, in labeling these isn't nearly as important as just knowing how to do whatever we need to do to solve it when we see it. Um, so when we're solving a pure time differential, you could say that solving it is finding the antiderivative. But you could also say that solving it is separating and integrating. It's just that when we separate and integrate this one, we're left with a one dy on the left-hand side. So when we integrate that side, we just get the y. So that's why it feels like all we're doing is finding the antiderivative with these pure time differentials. Now for the non, back to our non-autonomous option here. So with non-autonomous differential equations, a couple of things might happen. When we have a non-autonomous differential equation, we might need to solve it, but we can only solve it if it's separable. We might sketch a direction field or a slope field and talk about what the graphs of different solutions look like. 
or we might estimate solutions using Euler's method. We could be asked, well, I'm not actually taking the test. You all could be asked to do any of these things on the test. So the entire idea behind Euler's method, um, and we can think about it graphically or with equations, but the idea behind Euler's method is that we're gonna use the equation of the tangent line at each step. So I know that the things that go into my equation of a tangent line or our linear approximation, thinking back to 17a, I know that this would be like f of a plus f prime of a times x minus a. This is our approximation at x equals a. So I'm going to build myself a table to kind of keep track of what's going on with Euler's method. So what I need to know is the x that I'm at now, the y that I'm at right now, what the slope is so that I know my new y. And that's kind of how I think about Euler's method. So looking at our initial condition, right now, I am at x equals zero and y equals negative one. So that's my now, zero, negative one. To figure out my slope, where I'm at right now, that I'm gonna get from the differential equation. So my slope right now, I did not leave myself enough space in here, sorry. Slope and my new y. So my slope is equal to two times zero minus negative one squared. So my slope is zero, negative one squared would make it positive, but since we're subtracting, that's a minus one. So when I come over here to get my new y, my new y looks like the y that I'm at right now, negative one, plus my slope, negative one, times, and this x minus a term, this is really h. It's saying, how far are we gonna move over? How long are we gonna follow that slope? And I gave our h as 0 0.25. So that means I'm at negative one, and then minus 0.25. So that's negative 1.25. So if I paused here, what this would say is that y of 0 0.25 is approximately negative 1.25. But we're not going to pause there because we weren't trying to find y of 0 0.25. We're trying to find y of 0 0.5. So for my next row of the chart, I've taken a step over 0 0.25. So I started at an x of zero and my new, the x that I'm standing at now is 0 0.25 because we moved h. The y that I'm standing at right now is that negative 1.25. Now that I know where I'm standing, I need to get my slope. So my slope at this new point that I'm standing at looks like two times our x value, 0.25 minus negative 1.25 squared. Okay, I'm gonna try to do it without a calculator. Two times 0.25, well that's 0.5. Negative one, 0.25 is really 5 fourths, and 5 fourths squared is going to get messy. I lied, I'm pulling out a calculator just in the interest of time. 
So I've got 1.25 times 1.25. That's kind of gross, but this will be minus 1.5625. And that means that our slope is 1.0625. Sorry, negative, negative 1.0625. So to get my new y value, which is in fact going to be our final answer, to get our new y value, I say, okay, where is, where's my y value right now? I'm at negative 1.25. And then I'm gonna move in the direction of our slope. So negative 1.0625 times my h, my 0.25. And I'm gonna throw all of that into a calculator. And when you're doing the web work, you are definitely gonna want a calculator. I know that for the exam, that's not gonna be the case. And people have been freaking out about that a little bit, um, but I promise he's going to pick nice numbers and you're only gonna have to do a couple steps. So it's gonna be okay. Um, so my answer here is negative 1.516, which means using Euler's method, our estimate of y of 0 0.5 is that it's approximately negative 1.516. And again, just to reiterate, We've got like four people that asked in the chat, how would you do this without a calculator? So one of the things that um, Professor Chittery has said in class is really Euler's method is great for computers. We're just interested in understanding the process. So I will say this very first step that we should be able to do without a calculator. And if I had chosen a problem where this wasn't squared, for example, this step wouldn't have been that messy either, and we easily could have done two steps. 